So it's my pleasure to introduce Bhaskar. Bhaskar and I were grad students together at Berkeley. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to hear the talk on DKMC. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. So this talk is going to be on uh, an algorithm for decayed MCMC filtering. Let me begin with uh, a motivational problem. So um, is this showing up OK? So so there's a standard problem of uh, here's a user and uh, us using surfing the web. And what does this user want? To, uh, does she want to buy something, to read something interesting, just to be amused? Um, and let's. Uh, we can write this, we can see this is a problem of intent estimation over time, where you have a user whose intent is unobservable, evolves over time. Uh, and we have some algorithm which we call intent estimator, which uh, sees uh, things the user does, what they click on, what queries they type. And um, over time maintains an estimate of what their intent is. Are they looking to buy something, say, or are they just um, surfing? And once you have this estimate, uh, I guess you can use this to, to decide um, uh, various actions, such as what, what ads to show, what search results to show, and so on. So I've, I've, I've um, and this is a feedback process, obviously, because um, uh, the intended from one time step sort of affects what you think in the next time step. Uh, so I've, I've drawn it that way to, to sort of uh, show the relation to a much more general problem, uh, state estimation. So here, instead of a user, there's an environment with a hidden state evolving over time. There's a, a state estimator now receiving noisy observations from this environment. And we want to maintain an estimate of this hidden state, given all the observations we've seen so far. And when we have such an estimate, we can use it to answer queries uh, and make decisions what, what to do. So I'm going to be talking about what goes in there. And I'm going to be talking about a special case, uh, probabilistic filtering. So here, we're going to make various assumptions. First, uh, we assume that the environment has a state, xt, which evolves according to a Markov chain, uh, p of xt given xt minus 1. Uh, we assume that the observations, yt, uh, depend on the, only on the uh, hidden state at time t, xt. And we assume that what we want as a state estimate is a probability distribution over the hidden state, as opposed to, j say, just storing the most likely hidden state. So ideally, we want to have the, uh, the posterior probability distribution of the hidden state given all the observations so far. And we may or may not be able to achieve this for, for particular cases, but we would like to at least have an approximation of that. And there are some well-known uh, advantages of doing it this way, which is that if we maintain a distribution, we can keep track of many hypotheses if we're unsure what the, what the true state is. We can quantify how uncertain we are about things. Um, so, so going back to this um, example, uh, you can imagine that there's a, the hidden state is the, the user's intent, uh, which we, we, we could model using a, a, um, say, you know, how, how likely they are to click on things, how, um, how sort of willing they are to focus on reading something long, and so on. And we can have a model that evolves over time, of how, of how that evolves over time, and models of um, what, they would, what they would do as a result, like whether they would click on ads and so on. And, and I know that, uh, I guess, people here have studied these problems very much. So here's a couple of other examples. So here's, um, this is a picture of uh, a room with, um, um, a large uh, compute cluster. And so here we might have various questions like uh, keeping track of, over time, of which components have failed. Um, should we run diagnostics on any part of the system? Should, should we take any particular actions to fix things? And again, this, this can be naturally modeled by having hidden state being uh, the status of the various components, hard drives, networks, switches, and so on. Uh, observations being, um, say, throughput at various sensor nodes in, in the network, uh, job completion rate of machines, and so on. Second example, this is a picture from the, uh, of the winning uh, uh, entry from the DARPA 2005 Grand Challenge. And uh, controlling a, an autonomous vehicle like this requires being able to answer various questions, like where am I right now? Is there a car in my blind spot at this, at this instant? Do I need to refuel soon? And again, it's, you can model something like this by having a state consisting of your position velocity and also location of any other vehicles, pedestrians, fuel remaining, and so on. And you get observations from various sensors, like camera, GPS, rangefinder data, among other things. Right, so, so, so this is a really general problem, uh, state estimation and specifically probabilistic filtering. And in this talk, I'm going to be presenting an algorithm for this problem. 
So uh, first I'll talk about existing algorithms. Uh, there are many existing algorithms. I'll focus on two of them, uh, specifically exact algorithms, uh, the so-called Bayesian update, and one particular approximate algorithm called particle filtering, which is sort of the closest analog to, to, to the algorithm that we, will, uh, that, that we introduced. So before doing that, let me say uh, what we're aiming for uh, with this filtering update. So recall that there's going to be an environment producing observations y, and at each time we have a previous estimate of the distribution of the, the, the state at time t minus 1, and we want to take that together with the observation and produce distribution of the state at time t. So what do we want uh, from, 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 from that box over there? Well, first we want efficiency, uh, uh, specifically. The, the complexity of what happens at each time step should be independent of, of t. So in other words, if uh, the, the time we take to integrate a new observation should not grow with the number of observations we've seen so far. And the second thing is it, it, should, be, uh, it should in some sense have a mild dependence on, on how complicated the, the underlying probabilistic model is. And I've chosen to say it should just be polynomial in the model description. I'll be a bit more specific about what I mean by, by polynomial and model description um, in a few slides. Beyond uh, uh, efficiency, we also want accuracy. So we want, uh, one way of saying that is that for all times, the, um, the estimated distribution of our algorithm is close to the true, the true posterior given, given the observation so far. So let me just, uh, for concreteness, uh, 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 give us a very simple example. So let's say that we have a situation where the states and observations are both just small finite sets, say the numbers from one through n. And let's say we have the following Markov chain. So uh, the way it evolves is that uh, if you have xt being some number, then xt plus 1 uh, is xt plus or minus k with probability 1 over k squared uh, for all possible k. So in other words, it sort of moves around symmetrically, and it's, it's, it's less likely to move a long distance. So that's the, 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 the state Markov chain. And the observations, let's say that we, most of the time, we just see what the true state is. And every now and then, we get an outlier that's, that is just uniformly random. And of course, we don't know which are the outliers, so we don't know if we saw the true state or not. So here's a, here's a picture of a sample run. Uh, on the top row, we have the, the hidden states, which we don't know, of course. And at the bottom row, there are observations, um, 4, 5, 5, 6, and 11. And a filtering algorithm has to answer the question, given these observations, what is the, the probability of x5, the, the state at time 5, given these observations, 4, 5, 5, 6, 11. So just for intuition, I mean, if you, if you look at this observation sequence, there are kind of two possibilities. One is that 11 is, a, is just an outlier, an observation outlier, and really the state has stayed around 5 or 6 for this entire sequence. Second possibility is that maybe it really did jump to 11 uh, at the last step. And so you can imagine that the, the distribution looks something like this. Uh, it, it, there are two modes, one at 6 and one at 11. So this is the kind of thing that a filtering algorithm would, would do. OK, so let me start with the, the exact um, solution to, to find the true posterior distribution. So let's say we're given p of x t minus 1, the distribution over the, 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 the hidden state at time t minus 1, given the observations up to t minus 1. And now we have this new observation y t. So there are two, two steps. The first step is to propagate forward and find the distribution of x t, the state at time t, given, given uh, observations up to t minus 1. And this is the summation or integration if uh, x is continuous. And secondly, there's a conditioning step using Bayes' rule, where we uh, incorporate the, the effect of the, the teeth observation. Um, yeah. So this is completely general. It, doesn't, uh, it, it applies to any uh, distributions for the, for, for the state Markov chain and the observations. But uh, whether or not it's efficient depends on the specific distributions we have. So the first case where it's efficient is uh, known as the hidden Markov model, ubiquitous uh, model, probabilistic model. So here we assume that the state space is this finite set, uh, say 1 through n, uh, with transitions given by a matrix, uh, the, the transition distribution given by an n by n matrix. And here the, the, the exact algorithm I showed in the previous slide is called the forward algorithm, and uh, it can be done in time n squared. So in this sense, it's polynomial, because to describe the model takes you know, an n by n matrix, and the time, the update time is also uh, n squared, so that's efficient. Uh, second widely known case where it's efficient is uh, linear systems. So here we have uh, the state space is now a continuous uh, state space. It consists of real vectors, n-dimensional, uh, and the, the distributions are all linear Gaussian. And uh, we will always 
in, in this case, we would always maintain <coughs> the, the filtering distribution in, as a Gaussian with a mean and covariance. And uh, here again, it turns out that you can do the update, that is update the mean and covariance uh, in time and cubed, um, it, where n is the dimension. So again, it's polynomial because to represent the distribution takes, um, uh, already takes n squared uh, numbers, so uh, n cubed is, is still a polynomial. But that's where the good news ends because uh, those are the only tractable cases. So it turns out that many popular uh, families of uh, probabilistic models are all uh, intractable for this, for this exact filtering update. So this includes dynamic Bayesian networks, mixtures of Gaussians, hybrid models of, in, uh, of various sorts, uh, undirected graphical models. And I won't go into all of these, but let me just talk about one, dynamic Bayesian networks. Um, so um, I, on, on the right here, I've shown um, a dynamic Bayesian network. The, the basic idea is that for DBNs, the state x is divided into variables, let's say x1 through xn in this case. And we have some, um, the, the dependency model is local in some sense. So let me give an example. So let's say we have um, x being x1 through xn, where this represents some, uh, a model of propagation of failures in a network. So let's say that xi is 1 if machine i is uh, down, otherwise it's 0, right? And let's say the, um, the machines are arranged in a sort of a ring kind of topology so that you can imagine failures propagating from a machine to, to connected machines in a network. So if machine i fails, then at the next step, machines i minus 1 and i plus 1 are more likely to, to, to fail. So we can represent this using this, uh, the, the, uh, a graph where the arrow is basically uh, um, mean dependency. So, you know, this xt plus 1, 2 depends on xt1, xt2, and xt3. XT3. So the, the thing about this model is that even though there are two to the n states um, for, the, uh, for, the, for all the machines, you can describe the model using just O of n, uh, uh, o of n bits, um, or O of n numbers, because uh, we just need to say how each machine depends on, uh, each machine's failure depends on its, its, itself and its neighbors in the previous step. So in this sense, you can describe the model using you know, polynomial in n um, numbers, but can you do filtering in, in polynomial in, in, in n time? And the answer is no, um, so unfortunately. Because it turns out that even though the model can be represented in this compact form, um, the posterior distribution over time um, results in all the machines becoming correlated. And so it requires 2 to the n uh, parameters to represent, roughly. So, so even writing it down takes 2 to the n, so the, the filtering update has to take that long. And this is borne out by, you know, you can, you can easily verify this. So I've shown a graph here where the x-axis is the instance size of that, uh, of that model I showed in the previous slide. And the y-axis is log filtering update time. And the green line is how long the exact filtering update takes. So the fact that it's a straight line on, on this log scale means that it's exponential time. Um, so, so that's bad. And meanwhile, the blue line is, is our algorithm to KMCMC, MC. and I haven't described it yet, but you can see it's, it's sub-exponential. In fact, it'll turn out to be polynomial. And uh, so it, it is practical on that, on that class of models. And I'll be describing how that happens. Okay, so, so, so far we have exact filtering, which is intractable for most models. Uh, let's talk about particle filtering. So in exact filtering, if you remember, there are these two steps. You have uh, the previous distribution and a new observation, and there, we propagate and condition. Um, uh, so that those are the two steps that happen on each filtering update. And uh, during these steps, we are always representing uh, the, the distribution by either a probability vector or a set of sufficient st statistics in the case of a Gaussian, say. So particle filtering is basically that, except we represent the estimate by a set of samples instead, or, or particles as they're called. So it's a Monte Carlo method in that we represent a distribution by samples from it. And basically, it's, you just have to change uh, the propagation and conditioning operations to be sample-based. So let me just have a, show a quick sketch of how that works. So in this situation, we have three observations so far, 4, 5, and 5. And we have unknown states, x1, x2, x3. And so at any, at any point in particle filtering, we have a set of particles. So I've shown the squares up there, each of which represents a guess about the current state or sample uh, for, about the current state x3. So here we have particles that, we have two particles at five, one at four, and one at six. So it's sort of a distribution peaked at, at five, basically. And so the way it works is that when we see a new observation, 
we uh, propagate forward each particle. That is, for, for each particle, we sample from the transition distribution conditional on it. And then we incorporate the evidence by reweighting each particle based on how much it matches the evidence by, on, the, on the likelihood. So that makes some of the squares bigger there. And then finally, resampling. So here, um, we now have five, six, six, and six reflecting that the distribution is, thinks it's most likely six. So that's how each step goes in particle filtering. And uh, so as you can see, the, the complexity of that depends on how many particles you have, basically. So if you have a fixed number of particles, then, then the update complexity just depends on that. It doesn't depend, say, on how, much, how many observations you've had so far. So it's independent of t. So that's, that's good. And secondly, it's also often it's polynomial time in the model description. So for example, in that Bayesian network example I'd shown earlier, um, you can show that the particle filtering uh, update is polynomial in, in, the, in, the, in the size of the DBN rather than in the uh, number of states. So that's good, but what about accuracy? So, so what is known about particle filtering is, is consistency. So uh, to be precise, let's, let's fix a time step t. Let's say t equals 100. And let m be the number of particles. So what we can show is that if you imagine running particle filtering with m particles up to time step t, and let uh, consider the error that you uh, accrue by doing this. So this is a random quantity. And as the, the number of particles goes to infinity, this, this random quantity goes to 0 uh, almost surely. So that's good. That's certainly necessary for the, for the algorithm to be uh, uh, reasonable, but but it's it's important to to not read more into the, it than it's saying. So the point is that this is for a fixed time step t, and it's letting m go to infinity. But really, when we run particle filtering, we have a fixed finite m, and we're look, letting t sort of go. Uh, so we're, we're interested in that behavior. And what can happen is that with a finite number of particles, uh, particle filtering can lose track of the mode um, of the distribution. So I'd shown. So I've shown this example, right, where you see this uh, observation 6, and then you push those particles forward. And usually that's, that seems reasonable. But now suppose that um, what had happened between uh, time 3 and 4 is that, first of all, the state jumped to 15, and we got an observation outlier, so we saw 6 anyway. So this is obviously an unlikely event, but it's going to happen every now and then just due, due to chance. So the, the, the problem is that particle filtering takes a long time to recover from such an error. So suppose, for example, that we, on the next step we see, uh, we see 15, right? The thing is that particle filtering has a hard time um, changing its particles that it has to, to match that 15. It still has to propagate them through the, uh, through the transition distribution. So it can take a while. So even though we see multiple observations suggesting that the particles are very wrong, it, it can take a while for, for them to, to sort of stumble onto the true mode. Essentially, they're, they're doing almost a random walk uh, till they find the mode. And this example points to the, to, to the fact, I mean, uh, the reason for this example is that uh, essentially particle filtering is recursive. That is, uh, the samples you have at time t are going to be reused at time t plus 1, um, which reuses the, so you reuse the computation, but it also means that any mistakes you made uh, uh, it, at time t will propagate into the future. So if you guess strongly in your particles, then you take a while to recover from that, from that mistake. And the example I showed might have seemed kind of contrived, but in fact, it's ubiquitous in high-dimensional models. Um, this is like probably the biggest uh, problem that people have in, in practice with particle filtering. And uh, sort of intuitively, what the problem is that when you have a higher-dimensional model, each particle is like a guess about the entire state. And the more dimensions you have, the more likely you are to not guess correctly. And here's a, a graph showing what can happen. So uh, x is time, and y is the error. And the green line is particle filtering. So you can see that it has this uh, characteristic behavior where it, it's, sometimes it's correct, but then when it makes a mistake, it tends to stay. Uh, it, it takes a long time to recover. So it sort of stays uh, far from 0 for a while before coming back down. Uh, and it has a couple of such excursions. And our algorithm is more, the errors are more independently spread out because when it, it, it doesn't, um, it's not recursive, as we'll see. And so it doesn't, uh, it, it'll recover faster in that sense from errors. Right, so, so where we are is that uh, there are these two exa existing algorithms, exact, which is um, interactable in many cases of interest, and uh, particle filtering, which can take a long time to recover from, from errors. And so our algorithm was, was motivated by these, two, by these two problems. So 
So our algorithm is, is, is an MCMC algorithm. Um, so MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo is it's a, it's a family of uh, probability in, uh, inference algorithms. And the, the setting in MCMC is that you have some distribution pi of x um, over some x. And assume we can't compute pi directly necessarily. And maybe we can't even sample from it directly. So MCMC methods are based on saying, OK, we're going to set up instead a Markov chain k whose uh, stationary distribution is pi. So in other words, if you run, M, uh, run this Markov chain for a long time, you get samples approximately from pi. Uh, given such a Markov chain, you can run it for a long time, get these samples, and then use those samples as a Monte Carlo estimate. So we can answer any question we may have about pi by averaging uh, over the samples instead. And uh, uh, a special case of MCMC is, is called Gibbs sampling. So this is when uh, the target distribution is uh, x is over an x, which is divided into variables. So x is x1 through xt. And the idea in Gibbs sampling is that we, uh, x is like this vector. At, at each time, we're going to pick one of the components of x, so say i. And then we're going to flip the value of xi conditional on everything else. And then we're going to leave everything else alone. So, so we just repeatedly pick a component, flip it, pick another component, flip it, and so on. And that's how the Markov chain goes. And it's a fact that the stationary distribution of this process is pi. Um, you can sort of show that with a little bit of algebra. And uh, so, th so this is an MCMC algorithm for pi. Um, whether or not it's practical will depend on whether we can do that uh, second step uh, efficiently. That is, can we sample uh, x, the ith component, given all the other components um, of x? So we, we are going to use a, a Gibbs sampling algorithm for, um, for, for filtering. And before describing it, let me just set up some, some terminology. So there are going to be two Markov chains sort of floating around here. Um, first of all, there's the, the environment itself, which has a, st a hidden state. And that's evolving according to a Markov chain. I'll call that the physical Markov chain, p of xt plus 1 given xt. Uh, the state space is the hidden state of the system. And secondly, there's the, uh, the so-called computational Markov chain, which is the MCMC Markov chain. So here, the, the state space of this Markov chain is, is entire state trajectories. So x1 through xt, that's what uh, each state of this computational Markov chain looks like. And the goal is, to, is going to be to make the stationary distribution of the computational Markov chain be precisely the, the distribution, uh, the posterior distribution given, given the observation so far, p of x given y1 through t. So how would that look? Well, so here's, um, here's a... a, a a filtering situation. So let's say we've seen these observations. And to see how a Markov chain works, we have to say how to, how to update it, how to simulate from it. So let's say the current, the current state of the computational Markov chain is uh, on the second row there, 4, 5, 5, 6, 5. So how do, we, how do we flip this? Well, it's just the standard Gibbs sampling recipe. So randomly pick one of the components, say the fourth one, and now resample just that hidden state given everything else. So that's, that's what we have to do uh, on each step. Now, one optimization we can make right away is that although we, it looks like we have to compute the conditional distribution of that, that hidden state given everything, in fact, because of the, the Markovian uh, assumption, really, we, it only depends on the previous and next hidden state and on the current observation, so just those three variables. So computing that, that sampling distribution is, is not bad in that sense. So that's good. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running Gibbs sampling, getting, getting uh, you know, a sequence of state trajectories. <laughs> and from each one, we're going to just save the very, last, uh, the very last hidden state, because ultimately, we care about the distribution just of that hidden state, so we can throw away everything else. So, so that's, that's a perfectly valid uh, filtering algorithm, but is it, is it a good one? Uh, and the answer is no. So, so if you look at the, the, the Gibbs sampling step, right? Sample i uniformly and flip, flip x size value. So intuitively, um, because we care about getting a good estimate of, of xt, the teeth hidden state, we'll need to flip that at least a constant number of times. And that's going to take uh, t steps right there. So it's not good, because we don't want an algorithm whose, whose time is growing with t. And so the idea with, with our algorithm is that since we only care about the, the marginal distribution of xt, um, we, should be, we should sample that more often, because that's the only distribution we, we actually want to be accurate. And 
the, the thing that supports this is that Markov chains have uh, exponential forgetting, which, um, which says that the state k steps in the past in a Markov chain has an exponentially small effect on the current state, on the distribution of the current state. So this, this is a, a property of the physical Markov chain. And what this means is that we don't need to have a very accurate estimate of the distribution of the, you know, of, uh, the, the state 100 steps ago, say. So, so the algorithm is going to be sampling the distant past less often. And the way you can do this is by just changing Gibbs sampling. So instead of flipping a randomly chosen, a uniformly randomly chosen uh, time step, we're going to choose from this uh, decay distribution, which is biased towards the, the recent past. Um, and what do we want from this decay distribution? Well, it has to be positive for all, uh, for all times. So we should have some probability of being able to sample any time, no matter how far back it was. That's for correctness. And it should also intuitively, um, it should decay slower than the forgetting rate of the physical Markov chain. And so it turns out that a polynomial decay um, will end up doing all those things. So we use this decay, d of k is k to the minus alpha uh, for some alpha bigger than one. So for example, if alpha was two, then d of k would be one over k squared. So we'd be sampling things, k steps in the past with probability one over k squared. Why wouldn't you want it to be exactly the forgetting rate? As to so yeah, I mean, ideally we, you could do that, but the forgetting rate might be hard to, uh, to compute, it may also vary with the uh, observation sequence in different parts of the chain. So a polynomial will, will dominate any exponential. So, so I guess what you want is that the decay is no, no faster than, than the forgetting rate, right? Yeah. If you, if you match it, it would be fine. But yeah, not strictly be... slower, but yeah, no faster. Right. So, so, so related question. I mean, there, you'll, you, you're not talking about constants here, but you could imagine a situation where even though the, the, the forgetting rate is exponential, there's sort of close, the constants in that make it very, very little decay, say in the previous three states, say. Yeah. And, and then if you choose your k to minus alpha with a different constant, you could be really under, under sampling, say, the state, the, the third state back. You mean w w you, you choose the wrong alpha? No, well, you don't, right, so, if, if here you're assuming that you can change, because it's an exponential decay, you choose a polynomial, you are happy. But you're ignoring the factor, the constant factor in the, you know, the first, the recent states. Right? You actually want the function to be yeah. uh, dominated. It, by uh, so it could, be, it could be that even though, in terms of sort of asymptotics, this, this is a good choice in terms of, uh, of the sort of uh, short-term memory. It's mm. a very bad choice. It could be arbitrarily bad, actually, right? Because you could the constant. I mean, if you allow the model to become arbitrarily deterministic, then this can be arbitrarily bad yeah, in that sense. Yeah, yes, yeah. this is true. And yeah, that's a limitation, and I'll, I'll sort of talk more about that. Okay. But yeah, the, yeah and the choice of alpha in general is, is obviously, I mean, a problem. Right. So anyway, the, we have this algorithm, and uh, so the question is, does it is, is it a, a efficient? So first property is consistency, which says that, let's say you have a fixed evidence sequence, let m be the number of samples. As m goes to infinity, error goes to zero. So this is a very, you definitely need this property, and it's pretty straightforward for, for the finite case at least. But that's not really enough, because that, you know, um, ultimately we don't want to be running our MCMC to infinity, so how long does it take to get an accurate answer? So. When we uh, have this question about MCMC algorithms, you usually analyze it in terms of um, two things. First of all, uh, how long does each step of the, uh, the MCMC take, each step of the computational Markov chain? And secondly, um, what is the mixing time? That is, how many steps will we need of that comp computational Markov chain? Where the mixing time is defined as S, such that no matter what, no matter where you start the Markov chain off, after S steps, it's sort of spread out all over the state space to within epsilon of the stationary distribution. Okay, so if we sort of apply that to, to decayed MCMC, the problem we run into is that uh, intuitively to mix, that is to have an accurate estimate of the distribution of the, the state uh, trajectory, you have to flip each hidden state at least once. And so already that's linear uh, in, in the length of the observation sequence, so that's not good. So, um, so to, to deal with this, we, we extended the notion of mixing time. Um, so um, 
we define uh, what's called the marginal mixing time. So the, the idea roughly is that we're gonna, we are gonna run the Markov chains just long enough so that the distribution of the, the, the teeth state, xt, is accurate. And the uh, estimate of the other distributions can be quite bad, that's, that's fine. So th this, note, this is called the marginal mixing time. And given this definition, the main result that we were able to show was that for a particular environment model, um, the marginal mixing time of the KDMCMC for any observation sequence is, is a uh, O of one, where in particular it doesn't, uh, it can be bounded independently of, um, of the length of the observation sequence. Um, so that's what we want. We don't want it to be growing with, the, with, the, with, with T in that case. And uh, I won't go into the, the details of the proof, but it involves extending to this marginal case uh, various techniques from, from MCMC theory, such as path coupling and uh, log Sobel of bounds. It's in the paper. Um, but let, let me talk about that constant factor. So um, as, as you were saying, the, there, you know, there is this constant factor which depends on sort of how, how um, deterministic the physical Markov chain is. Um, and uh, so if, if it's very deterministic, then that's gonna make the, the, the decayed MCMC chain also mix slower. And I have some ideas for, for, for dealing with that. <clears throat> okay, well let me talk about some practical considerations. So okay, I've sort of been vague about what you do with this Markov chain. I mean, I've said you run it and you take samples from it, but how exactly does that work? So given a time budget, say how many chains should you run, uh, which samples from those chains should you use, and how do you initialize the chains? So the most, so the naive thing you could do for an MCMC algorithm is to say, well, I'm gonna run the chain for a while, take the last sample, run the chain, take a sample, run the chain, and so on. So here you're getting IID samples from approximately the stationary distribution you hope. But no one actually does this because it's extremely wasteful in throwing away most of your samples. So one thing that people often do is one long chain, just run a single chain for very long and take you know, all the samples beyond, beyond some uh, uh, burn-in point. And a third thing that people do is something in between where you run many chains but you take uh, multiple samples from each chain. So there's actually uh, some debate between two and three uh, in, in the statistics community, which is, which is better uh, in general. Um, for our setting, there, there's some particular constraints in the problem, that, uh, which is that we will be running MCMC repeatedly on related problems if we're filtering. So that is, you know, at time t, we run MCMC given the uh, evidence up to time t. At time t plus one, we get a new observation and run MCMC again. So we, we will have these re re, uh, related problems. And because of that, that suggests uh, having parallel change. So at time t, we're gonna run uh, k computational Markov chains for some parameter k and get some samples from each one. At time t plus one, use the, extend the final sample of each chain from the previous time step, extend that by one, by one hidden state, and use that to initialize k new chains. So the hope is that if the model is not completely noisy, then the sample from, the last sample from the previous, from the previous time step will be somewhere near a high probability region of the uh, for the next step. And so the hope is by, by having multiple chains like this, we, uh, it encourages exploring uh, multiple modes of the, um, of the distribution. So this, might, this can help to alleviate uh, the problems with, with determinism some, uh, slightly. Okay, so let me just talk about those graphs again. So here, this was, uh, if you remember, a graph where the x-axis is the instance size for, for a DBN, y-axis is log uh, filtering time. So uh, exact is exponential and decayed MCMC is, is a polynomial there. And so uh, with DBNs, um, it turns out that, so you can do each step of decayed MCMC, that is the Gibbs sampling step, you can do that in polynomial time. I haven't really said how that works, but it's basically a standard uh, graphical model inference techniques. And also the marginal mixing time is often uh, polynomial time in N, um, in the, in the graph size. Um, so, so, so that uh, explains the, the previous graph. So now for the, for the particle filtering uh, example. So, so going back to that graph, yeah. so, so there isn't, uh, so this is tells us filtering time, but I, I'm not sure com with respect to what the tolerance parameter on the, on the actual estimate. So I ran this, um, I ran decayed MCMC until like, until multiple runs of it were giving an answer that was within uh, like 0.05 of, of the truth. That's, that's where the y-axis comes. 
Okay. And so if you remember with particle filtering, the, the issue was this correlated error uh, business where once you make a mistake, it takes a while to recover. And um, so why is this? Well, so both decayed MCMC and particle filtering are sample-based, but in DMCMC, the samples represent the entire state trajectory. So what this means is that you can, in the, in the light of new observations, you can go back in time and say, well, that sample that I have 50 steps ago is wrong, and I should flip it. Uh, it has the ability to do that, and it's non-recursive. And, um, and in particle filtering, on the other hand, the samples represent only the most recent state, and it only resamples the current state. It can't go back in time and change its mind. And it's recursive, which is good in the sense of re reusing computation, but as we saw, it has this, um, the, the potential to, to make errors that, are, that sort of last for a long time. Okay, so that about wraps it up. So uh, in conclusion, um, I've talked about this algorithm, Decayed MCMC, that is a sample-based filtering algorithm. It's, it's widely applicable, unlike exact methods, and it scales well with respect to, to both the history length and the, the model size. So there are various uh, topics for future work. One is to extend to models with more determinism. I think there are various ideas here, like uh, integrating with, uh, with uh, logical inference, like SAT methods, and also with, um, with sampling at different sort of time granularities, the different variables, um, uh, uh, like sampling the ones that evolve more slowly at a different time scale. A second thing is uh, the trade-offs with particle filters. So neither of these uh, algorithms dominates the other, but um, I think you can get some more insight as to which one will do uh, well in what sort of model. And finally, um, I think the idea of focusing your, your sampling on around the variables that you actually care about um, is, is more general than just filtering. It applies any, to any situation where you have a large probability model and we have a query about some small piece of it. You'd like to focus your sampling around things that affect th th that small piece. So I think that's uh, another fruitful direction. Quick yep. um, can you give an example of a problem where part filtering beats DKMCMC? Um, I mean, if like the, the, the graph there was from uh, a linear Gaussian where um, the the observations were pretty uh, the observation model was pretty low variance, and that tends to um, cause problems for particle filtering because it, it, it sort of becomes overly sure and you get like sample collapse problems basically. Mm -hmm. So if if on the other hand you have a model where it's extremely uh, the state transitions are pretty deterministic. That's bad for DMCMC, but particle filtering doesn't uh, care about that so much. I see. So the transition model is more deterministic. DMCMC will not mix as well with particle filtering. Yeah, particle filtering doesn't have an issue with having to mix, so it's okay. So actually, uh, I have another question about this comparison. So what exactly did you compare? Like, was it the same running time for particle filtering and your thing, or was it the same number of samples, or like, how did you? I, I mean, I should, I guess, Ideally, you should compare uh, running time. I did number of samples because they, they, they both scale with that, like linearly yeah, in that. But each sample in the particle filtering is much cheaper than, than a sample. Than uh, I mean, it's not much cheaper. I mean, it's uh, because, I mean, in another case. Well, you don't have any burn off, burn, initial burn off and stuff like that. Right? Oh, when I say each, I mean, each sample as in each sort of flip of decayed MCMC versus each particle in particle filtering. OK, so, so at the end of the day, particle filter had more samples to generate its distribution than MCMC. Because some flips MCMC cannot use, right? Like initial burn off and stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a small amount. Uh, so oh, everything, it's, I think also, it's, everything in the past, MCMC should, you know, all the flips that happened in the past. You mean at previous time they, steps? Yeah, they don't generate new samples. Right? They're not generating samples here, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not using them in that sense, except in the initialization, as I, as I talked about. They kind of get, uh, you know, you used to set the initial thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, anyway, you have holes when your signals are fairly noisy and your underlying process is really deterministic. So you can be running for a long time and not really know that the transition happened five stages back because you're not getting very strong signals. Is there any way you could say, gosh, things are looking worse now, right? My, my likelihood has gone down. Maybe it's time to do more sampling, right? So dynamically adjust how much sampling you do based on the yeah. building going down. Yeah, and you, you, that's, I guess, one of the strengths because, I mean, it's not like in particle filtering where you have, you can't, like, go back and change the number of particles you used 10 steps ago, but you can, like, run MCMC for a bit longer. Um, yeah, I mean, and there are diagnostics for convergence that you could consider using. 
uh, MCMC conversion diagnostics. So yeah. what will happen this? It's not just running it longer. You can also change the alpha, right? As long as things right. seems fine, then fine. I, 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 I don't need to explore the past because I'm pretty sure that I'm, that I'm doing well. But once you kind of things go down, the probabilities are small, then well, maybe I should look more at the past evidence and kind of yeah. be more aggressive with, with alpha. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the setting of alpha is, yeah, I mean, something that I haven't thought about very much, but definitely you can set that adaptively. Consider looking at the distribution over the initial state to see if it's you know strongly multimodal and maybe you know paying attention to that as well because for example if it's strongly bimodal and and it's reasonably deterministic later on you could sort of go down two paths it might be worth really sorting out the initial state you mean the initial sort of physical state of the uh, yeah I mean that that will to some extent happen automatically if you if you imagine initializing say uh, I mean, I haven't really talked about how you initialize the, the chain, but if you initialize it from like the prior, uh, before seeing observations, you'll get like half. I mean, you'll get some samples well, from the yeah, different modes. If you make the wrong guess there, um, you should perhaps, if it, and, and the distribution is multimodal, you know, strongly bimodal, or something like that, then maybe you should be ready to revisit that initial guess, you know, uh, that initial guess later on. You should devote time to early on in the chain. I see. I mean, you, you're saying that. I mean, yeah, this, this relates to the whole determinism issue, right? Like, if you're, you're, if you're stuck in a mode, then you kind of, it's hard to flip just one, one thing because it'll be sort of uh, inconsistent with what's before and after it. So my, I mean, my, my feeling with sort of these very deterministic models is that you have to, in a sense, you have to flip the mode all at once for the entire sequence. You can, I mean, if you have another variable that encodes which mode you're in, then you'd like to sort of flip that all at once for, or for large portions of the sequence. Like, this is, you know, like corresponds to blocking in, in, in Gibbs sampling in general. Yeah. Do you think we run it backwards, where you, you, you've got an observation, things looking bad, you just yeah. start choosing values from the, from the current back, you know, the past for a ways, and then try to patch that into one of your previous models, so you can kind of get over the, the local minima. Yeah, yeah. That, so in other words, sort of not take, not take into account the old value, I mean, not do a Gibbs sampling step, but some other sort of more complicated. Uh, well, do a Gibbs sampling, do a Gibbs sampling look paying attention only to the recent right. past. And then, and then see if you can find something that will hook onto that. Oh, for, 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 for the recent, the recent future, not, not the recent. Okay, it's, the, the, well, the, the I, recent. Well, I, 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 the recent yeah. samples. Right, right. Yeah, you only look at the future rather than yeah. the past when you're doing a good sample. I wonder if you could prove anything about a, a sampling step where you start flipping from the present backwards and you yeah. keep moving backwards yeah. until you get no change. Because if you get no change, then everything back beyond it. You've already sort of sampled that space already. Nothing interesting is going to happen there. Yeah, you can, you can speed up Gibbs sampling by sort of being clever about that. Like if you know in advance, I mean the, the set of... Proof consistency though, and then conversions um, be hard if you're... Yeah, yeah, it depends on the, on the specific... I mean, but algorithmically, you, the, the, there's improvements like that you can certainly do. Um, like if you know that if... The thing is that the set of indices you sample is independent of like the, the values you sample for the flips. So you can kind of use that to to ignore a lot of your sample, or to not do a lot of your samples if they're never going to matter for the distribution of the current state. So let me go back to an early question and, and, and sort of, so the, the, because the, the, the mechanism you're using, you reset, when you start, continue, you extend the existing sa um, samples first and then, and then sa and start your chains from there. Yeah. So that kind of imposes a certain kind of inertia in this, in, into, the, into the sampling. That makes it a little bit recursive. Yeah, like and, and so, I mean, in one way, that goes against your criti critique of a purely recursive method. But on the other hand, for these bimodal situations where you were, where early on you made a decision, am I going to the left or to the right? And now I'm in this corridor and I'm deterministically going down one way versus on that corridor. Mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, many of the sort of... Uh, Particle filtering examples you see right up from uh, robots going down corridors yeah. at, at CMU, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> or at Stanford, I think the fellow doesn't see it. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, but you know, but basically, at these bimodal situations with a lot of determinism. So I'm I'm wondering whether you, you can say something uh, more precise about the inertia imposed in your sampling by this method. And with relation to the kind of inertia you have in particle filtering that helps you with the situation. So I, I don't know what the, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. think this method is sort of like, yeah, it's sort of, when you have the initialization, it's, start, it's sort of, it's starting to look like sort of in between particle filtering and decay yeah. MCMC, like you can sort of interpolate between the two methods perhaps. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you can say precisely. I mean, um, I guess you'd have to look at the, 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 the particle filtering convergence bounds and see how they depend on the parameters of the model ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, in that bimodal case, you know, there are parallel chains here. So you would, you would uh, hope that if you have enough parallel chains, you get, cha you get uh, particles in both modes at least. I'm trying to remember, uh, there are folks here, yourself included, probably even more expert on this than I am, but uh, there are uh, particle filter approaches that insert new particles, right, to help handle sort of the surprise effect and, and getting out of uh, sort of these, getting in the wrong mode kind of problems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and is there some sort of corollary here of sort of starting new chains that would help you sort of handle these, these modes? Um, you mean, it's sort of, it's sort of, you know, get, yeah, allowing yourself to say, okay, all these traces are actually bad. Here's a new trace that's actually good. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I bet there is. I mean, like, yeah, there are all these MCMC methods that there are all these methods to improve particle filtering with some MCMC moves in addition to the uh, like done to your particles. And yeah, you could similarly, uh, yeah, you could certainly start new chains if you if you thought that was necessary. Did you apply any of this to kind of non-synthetic data, to kind of real-life uh, examples? No, unfortunately, I mean, we didn't have, yeah, we, we didn't, uh, I mean, we, we, so we did it on like DBN examples in linear Gaussians, uh, but uh, yeah, that was it. I mean, that would be, that would be nice, of course, to uh, sort of apply to real problems. Any more questions? Okay, let's pass for this.